You also, uh, Philip, at BlackRock actually came out with the second year outlook and this in kind of the market turmoil that we saw in the last couple of days. What do you think will be the biggest pitfall for markets from here until December? Uh, good morning, Francine, from beautiful Venice. Look, I think the biggest risk remains uh, COVID. We need to accelerate vaccines, administer them, and I think very importantly also think about the, the, the developing countries. Right now we're doing reasonably well, uh, stalling somewhat. Uh, the effort has to be just to continue forcefully to administer the vaccines. Is there a danger that actually markets are, are not worried about inflation, but they're worried about growth? And if you look at China and if you look at other parts of the world, we should worry more about what kind of recovery we will see than currently priced in. I think if you, if you look at the developed world, I'm convinced we have a, a restart. It's real, it's powerful, and it's rapid. In fact, looking at the U.S. economy, it looks to me as strong as it's been in, in decades, frankly, generations. So uh, I, I'm not worried about growth. I think we're going to see very, very strong growth numbers. We are also going to move into a higher inflation regime. The, the collaboration between monetary and fiscal policy that has allowed us to bridge uh, COVID will lead us into a higher inflation regime. Uh, it will take some time to settle, so I don't think we should pay too much attention to the very short-term numbers, but inflation will move higher uh, as we kind of go through this transition phase. What's the, the most surprising thing when you look at, you know, the, the mid-year outlook and you're really looking beyond the restart and maybe some of the legacy of COVID and how our economies will differ? What surprised you the most in this, Philip? Well, I think we have an unusually wide range of views right now, both, frankly, internally at BlackRock amongst our portfolio managers, but you can also see that uh, across the market. So, you know, that leads to the market is looking for which, which of these outcomes turns out to be the most likely one, and, and so we should expect to see some volatility as we move forward. I think the, the, the biggest issue, the biggest longer-term question is, can we get through this restart uh, can we implement these no monetary policy regimes that have been adopted by the major central banks without unhinging long-term inflation expectations? That will be, uh, over the next three years, let's say, the most important challenge the central banks will face. And as we, as we proceed into this restart, uh, the market will begin to focus on that. And Philip, I mean, you basically suggest that there's a wide range of potential outcomes. Again, if you go back to the markets and what we've been seeing in bonds over the last couple of days, does it mean that, you know, a lot of people can make money but also lose money quite quickly, given how markets are priced right now, that bonds are going one way or telling us one thing and the rest of the market something else? I think because we have a wide range of potential outcomes longer term, uh, it's going to be very hard to time the market in the short-term trading kind of sense. Uh, you know, this is what happens when, when the market is trying to, to calibrate itself and look for the, the right path. There's going to be a lot of movement back and forth, as we've seen. So I think that the most sensible thing to do is to uh, not pay too much attention to the very short term, to the 24-hour news cycle, and really focus on, on the big story. And, and right now, that will be the restart. I think we're going to see some easing signals coming out of China. That's a very important macro signal. And then, as I said, longer term, the big question will be, can we pull this off without um, unhinging uh, or undermining long-term um, inflation expectations? I mean, what does China actually mean for BlackRock? Is it a, an investment destination, or do you worry about some of what we've heard this week, which is a crackdown, for example, on technology, but also the, the kind of reversal that you were talking about that PBC, PBOC has done uh, to support the economy? Yes, uh, China is a very important part of the story. It's a, it's a huge part of the global economy. Most investors are under allocated to China. If you think about the, the long term allocation, that long term allocation will go up. It's inevitable as, as China represents such a big weight. At the same time, there's a risk premium attached to, to some of the strategic tensions between the U.S. and China, as well as some of the issues around the, the tech sector, the interference of the state in, in the marketplace, in the economy. Uh, and we have seen these, these recent um, 
slowdown signals, which again I think will, will now lead to a, uh, an easing of policy, which will be a very significant development uh, on the macro side. So I think these announcements the last few days coming out of China are actually potentially more important or equally important as the, uh, some of the tensions we've seen around the, the Chinese tech companies. Uh, Philip, do you worry? I mean, you, if you look at U.S.-China tensions, I don't know whether that's less worrying than some of the global supply chain issues or access to chips that, that we've seen and whether that is probably the biggest risk for the economy and, again, what that translates into for central banks. It's a tension point, undoubtedly. It's a risk factor. At the same time, you know, these economies now are so integrated. When you compare this to the Cold War, where we had equal sort of tensions between the Soviet Union and, and the United States, at the time, the, the Soviet Union was a fraction of, of what China represents in the global economy. So both sides have a, an inherent and, and profound interest to manage these tensions. They will be with us uh, for a long time, perhaps for a generation. Uh, but you have to believe that they can be managed and will be managed simply because there's so much at stake. There's such a deep... Uh, a deep degree of economic integration now between these two economies and China is very big. China is a big part of the global economy, um, much bigger than the Soviet Union ever was even during the height of the Cold War. So I think it, it, it's a different setup. It is a risk and investors will take that into account as they, as they look to increase the allocation to China uh, in the long term. Again, if you, if you just look at the facts today, uh, there's no doubt that uh, investors are broadly speaking under allocated to China. Uh, from a diversified uh, portfolio perspective. Uh, how are you feeling about Europe right now? And I want to ask you a little bit about, uh, Philip, the European banks. But in general, is, is the European economy holding okay? It doesn't have enough, or it doesn't have as much stimulus as the U.S. Uh, and, and we have some very important elections coming up later this year. I think the economy looks good to me. It's, uh, it's going to be strong. We're going to see the same restart dynamic that we're seeing in the U.S. It's lagging a little bit. The, the vaccinations are running behind a bit. But essentially, it's going to be the same story. I think there are some very positive developments in Europe. The, the, the recovery fund is, is a powerful vehicle. If you look at the sums of money that will be invested in countries like Spain, Greece, and, and Italy, these are extraordinary opportunities to change the path of, of longer term growth in, in these countries. And I think that's the, the real historic opportunity that Europe now has for the first time in a long time, thanks to the, the public sector, thanks to the, the, the policy response during COVID, we're going to have the ability to see huge investments being made uh, from the public sector, hopefully also incentivizing private capital to move. So I think there is a story here uh, that looks very attractive for Europe, provided, and this is the key point, that these public funds are invested in a way that, uh, that enhance long-term growth potential and, and enhance long-term productivity potential in the European economy. But I remain, frankly speaking, uh, quite optimistic as far as Europe goes uh, in these as the months proceed and as, as the restart proceeds. Philip, is it, is it in, at the start of or mid-2022 that we'll see whether there's finally appetite for cross-border you know, banking consolidation in Europe? Well, look, this is, this is a topic you and I have discussed for years, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, this is, I mean, there is not going to be a better time than, than this restart period, let's say the next 18 months for the European authorities to really complete banking union. There is going to be no better window than now. We're going to see very strong growth numbers. Uh, we're going to see, um, you know, a moderate response, if any, from the central bank, uh, even if inflation w will rise, which is what I would expect. Uh, so this is, in a, in a way, going to be a, almost a sweet spot for completing uh, the unfinished business around banking union. And uh, once you have that in place, if the recovery continues and if we do see some pickup in, in potential growth beyond the restart, then I think it could become very interesting for the banks to look at, at growth opportunities. They have been in, in retrenchment mode for, for years now. They've been in business model repair mode. Uh, you know, it is time to get back into growth mode uh, at some point over the next couple of years. This is the window to do that. 
Um, Philip, when you look at the new strategic review actually from the ECB yesterday, how much of a game changer is it for the economy, but especially for the market? So, you know, the ECB president will ha have a communication challenge on July the 22nd, but does it actually mean that they could be much more accommodative for longer, or is it still all to play? I think what came out to me looks very sensible and, and frankly um, we should commend the president for, for having done this in, in the way she did, in getting uh, full consensus behind these uh, deliberations. It, these are difficult moments for a central bank and the last thing you need is divisions within uh, the council. She managed to do this, uh, I thought, very effectively. Uh, the outcome to me is sensible. It's a bit more cautious than the Federal Reserve's mm -hmm. new framework, so it doesn't have an explicit kind of make-up strategy dimension, which again I think is sensible given the, the European history and the European sensitivities as well as the mandate of the central bank. At the margin it gives more room, uh, but I think at any rate we have to assume that the policy response is going to be very muted going forward relative to what history would suggest when you look at where inflation is going to go. And, and that's true for the U.S., certainly, very much true for the U.S., but I think it will be true also for, for the ECB. And the new framework at the margin could contribute to that, but I don't think it, it, it changes the path fundamentally. It, it, it re-emphasizes that they will not make the mistake the ECB made in, in 2011, that's for sure.